Welcome to another episode of the Waffle Shop podcast. Today, I'm joined by an absolute legend, author, mental wellness advocate, and in my eyes, Hollywood royalty, Lisa Jacob. Welcome to the Waffle Shop. Taylor, I'm so embarrassed now. Thank <laughs> you. I'm thrilled to be here, but that, that intro was a lot to live up to, man. Well, I think to be fair, you kind of lived up to it before we hit the record button. <laughs> Because like that kind of like child in me is like screaming inside it. <laughs> That's very sweet. Thank you so much for having me. No, it is an genuinely like an absolute pleasure. So I don't even know where to begin with this waffle because there is so much I kind of want to talk about. But I think I I've, I've, I've need to kind of talk to you about like your kind of like mental health journey and how now you are. You, you found like this huge like passion for helping others and kind of the importance of looking after yourself. Yeah. Not to kind of like throw you under the bus here a little bit and obviously feel free to share with me whatever you want, but how did that journey start for you? Uh, it, it started probably when I was a really little kid. I've always been anxious. I've always been a worrier. I had my first panic attack when I was probably 11. So it's just constant in, in my life, this need to be aware of what's, what's going on with my mental health. And for a long time, I had no clue how to talk about it. I thought it was just me and I was a freak and I needed to hide it because everybody else was doing just fine. And what was my problem? And so I really felt deeply ashamed for a a really long time until I I realized like, this is not helping me. Hiding Mm -hmm. from this is not helping me. And it was really in in my 20s when I started to get very honest about what was going on with my anxiety, my depression, my panic disorder, that I was able to realize one that I I am not alone with this, that so many other people have issues with this. And two, that the more honest I can be in sharing what I go through, the more I can empower other people to know that it's okay for them to be honest as well. And that's why I talk about it so much. I don't talk about it because it's super fun to talk about my own mental (laughs) health issues. I talk about it because the ripple effect means that other people can, can feel less alone and can feel like some of that stigma is removed and that they can, can get help in whatever way is appropriate for them too. I think it is one, thank you for sharing that to me. And two, it is so powerful and it's to be fair it's one of the reasons why it's kind of led me here to have this chat with you because I've learned so much about my mental health by having these kind of conversations and listening to other people's kind of stories and struggles and it it does it reassures you that you're not a weirdo like everyone regardless of like you know their walk of life or you know what status they have if you like but everyone's feeling these really normal natural emotions Yeah. And I think for such a long time, there has not been this social support around being honest about that. Like getting therapy has some sort of stigma, being honest about, you know, if you're having a a, a low point in your life, people would get uncomfortable with that. And I think we are starting to hit a real shift now socially where that is really starting to change. It, it, it's not changing as fast as it should and as fast as I wish it would. But I think, you know, things like your show and things like, you know, more people talking about this really is, uh, you know, and I'm not being hyperbolic here, like it will save lives because people can be more open about these things now. Yeah not to sound all deep and stuff or narcissistic kind of like on my own show, but this whole kind of journey and like talking about it and this little waffle behind me has, has saved my life. It gave me that outlet and that kind of, kind of knowledge that, yeah, okay, I'm talking about it. Like, and the way it kind of connects to so many different people, like even having this conversation now, like if you'd have told me like a year ago, I'd be sat here having this conversation with you so openly and as normal as like, mental health and and anxiety and it's just 
like it's as if like I've just met you in the pub and like oh how are you right. doing like how's things it's like <laughs> but that's what I love about it and I agree like we're definitely moving in the right direction but we've got so much work and so much like more kind of legwork to put into this yeah absolutely one of the things that I also have to talk to you about is your passion for writing Mm -hmm. because anyone who has like a real passion like especially when it comes from kind of like some kind of like painful experiences and to then turn that into like a passion that is helping so many other people like is that something that you've always done like growing up or yeah, it is something I've always done. And it's funny, I was actually, I was literally just writing this story yesterday. I'm, I'm working on my new book and I was, I was writing the story for the new book, which is when I was probably eight years old, my family and I, we went camping. And wh- whenever we would go camping, we would take our dog. And we were camping and we were by this river and out of nowhere, these two dogs came out of the woods and attacked my dog. And it was this whole fight and there was blood and teeth and they were fighting and growling and it was terrifying. My dog got injured. And so we had to gather her up and put her in the car and rush her to the vet. And she was fine. Uh, she ended up, you know, being okay. And we just, yeah, I know it starts off with a scary wow. dog story, but it's okay. I would never tell a bad dog story. But I was so scared and and traumatized by seeing this. And we went home. We had to leave our dog at the vet so she could get medical attention. And we went home. And I I didn't even know what I was doing, but I went to my room and ransacked it and found a a blue crayon and just wrote out everything that had happened. Wow. And I I still have it, actually. I have what I wrote. That's amazing. And nobody told me to do it. I just had this feeling like I have all of this inside me and I don't know how to process what I've just seen, which was so scary and upsetting. And I put it down on the page and something clicked in that moment where I went, oh, this is how I, I process the world. This is how I, I acknowledge the feelings that I have that I don't know what to do with. I don't shove them down. I don't pretend they're not happening. I can put words and, and sentences and phrases and commas to them and put them on the page and then I can see them and I can understand them. And so really from that point on, uh, good things happened, bad things happened. I wrote everything down and it didn't feel real until I had done that. And so that has been something that has been with me really my, my entire life. Um, and there, you know, there are times when I forget to do it and times where I'm (laughs) like, oh, it's just too much. I can't write that. But Whenever How many I crayons have you got? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, but whenever I, I come back to it, I realize that that it really is such a power powerful tool for me. It's kind and of like free therapy, isn't it? Yeah, exactly, <laughs> exactly. And it's it's so free of judgment. Um, and you know, I would, I would never show anybody what I wrote. So I could write even the most terrible things that were in my mind and, and know that it was okay. And, you know, they're doing so many studies now about therapeutic writing and how powerful it is and how it helps people deal with chronic pain better and recover from trauma better. And, you know, even really resistant types of post-traumatic stress are responding really well to therapeutic writing. So it's, it's something that has has just served me really well. And, and now I'm, I'm really honored. I, I work a lot with combat veterans and, and we do a lot of writing together. And that is something that, that I have seen them really benefit from. And, and I'm just so honored to be able to kind of pass that on because not everybody can afford therapy. Not everybody can have access to those sorts of things. And you're exactly right. It's, it's free therapy. Everybody can do it. There's something quite powerful as well, like seeing your thoughts like on paper as well. Like I'm a huge advocate for like journaling. And I used to 
I did that typical like male thing or to be honest, I don't even think it's a male thing like you know journaling is kind of sitting down before you go to bed like dear diary like today <laughs> and it's just not that and it's just kind of it was difficult at first to get into but now like I can really notice a shift in my mental health if I haven't got those thoughts out of my head and you said something very powerful there about like you know you can write some terrible things but no that it's kind of okay because mm-hmm. that's you, you're not your thoughts and that's been one of the biggest lessons that I've learned from getting my thoughts out onto paper journaling and realizing like yeah you know what pops up in here is sometimes like dry, dreadful but it doesn't mean <laughs> like, I'm a dreadful person it's ah uh, this is this is really my favorite already <laughs> <laughs> I remember my therapist saying to me for the first time, you know, you're not your thoughts, right? And I was like, wait, what? Say that (laughs) again, because that was such news to me. And, and I think it really was something that was helped by the writing to, to understand that things are going to come into your head. It, 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 it's up to you how, how much power you want to give them. And sometimes when you can put it on paper, you can, you can actually just put it down, you put it down on paper and you can put it down and you don't have to carry it around inside you anymore. And I think that's just, it's, it is life-changing. I literally, you are speaking my language, everything you're saying, I'm like, yes. (laughs) <laughs> yes so if there's like I could turn the volume up on this and just like play it into the streets like I would because <laughs> yeah. I feel like so many people would benefit like yeah. from getting out because we we do especially this past year like it's been so <sighs> tough for so many people Awful. but just simple tools like this can like you said like can save lives it's like it's a way of making you realize that I keep saying this like weirdo word but I'm gonna go with it like you're not weird <laughs> like you know, yeah. it's normal to feel these things. Yeah. And I think we're well, all weird. Like, I think this, oh, the, embrace the your are. weird is just my mantra. Like, we are <laughs> all weirdos and it's all good because that's what make life, like, m- makes life interesting. Exactly. Like, I'm, yeah, I'm with you on that one. I, w- I wanted to ask, because with, obviously with the writing and with the pandemic, like, what are your coping mechanisms other than kind of like writing? I know, like, obviously you're a massive, like, yoga fan and, like, meditation. Is that something that, again, like, has helped you through the past, well, sorry for swearing, but kind of like the shower of shit that has been <laughs> the yeah. past year? Oh, my God, we can swear here? I'm so glad. Oh, yeah, you say what you want. Oh, so relieved. Okay, <laughs> good. <for> that. <laughs> most of the time I'm just thinking, like, don't swear, don't swear, don't swear. Oh, no, say what you want. <laughs> Fantastic. Oh, great. Uh, total shit shower, complete disaster. Uh, yes. And incredibly <laughs> difficult to, to get through all of this on, on so many different levels. Um, and so writing has definitely been helpful for me. And then mindfulness practice, meditation, and yoga have been just so profound for me in finding a way to find a little bit of peace in the middle of the chaos. And it's like, there is so much that is not within our control. And uh, I think many of us pointing to myself here (laughs) have uh, learned a lot about a loss of control. And we have learned a lot about this idea that we, we have assumed there has been stability and predictability in the world. And if we plan something for three months from now, well, then yes, it'll happen. And it's like, well, fuck that all went out the window. And so, you know, being able to work with whatever the real life scenario is that we are living in, but finding ways to work with the sympathetic nervous system, work with the breath, work with the mind in order to at least have some influences over our responses to the triggers, even if we can't fix the pandemic or fix the family members that are driving us insane or whatever it might be that they we know who they have. Are. What's that? <laughs> they know who they are. They know who they are. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. They should get it to together this. on their own, but whatever. <laughs> um, but yeah, being able to 
kind of work within the constraints of, of our lives as they are and and really work with with our internal world and our internal monologue um, and that mind body connection is something again that everybody can can do and i'm very aware of the fact that there are not always resources to have one-on-one -on -one therapy and so what are the things that are low cost that you can do without leaving your house and that's really important to me there's something there that you said. So I keep doing this because I'm like literally hanging on every word you say because I feel like you're in my head a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> but there was something you said there about kind of like the control side of things. And I don't know if I'm going to put words into your mouth here, but I feel like there's a sense of like you're quite similar to myself where you need to kind of, you feel like you are in control. So when something kind of like a minor inconvenience comes along, it's like the world's ending. Like, yeah. It, and I feel like this kind of pandemic has taught me to focus on what I can control rather than what I can't. And it has been probably one of the biggest blessings in disguise that has come from this pandemic, especially like for my mindset. Would you be fair? Would that be fair to say that? You, I can see like you that smile on your face. So <laughs> Yes. No, it's absolutely true. And I think, you know, I'm, I'm, a bit, I don't know why I'm saying a bit. I am a perfectionist. I'm not a bit yeah. of a perfectionist. I'm a perfectionist. <laughs> a lot of people who have anxiety, I think, have have issues with perfectionism. And so, you know, learning that there are just there are those things that are not going to go your way. There are those things that it doesn't matter how hard you work at them, it's not going to work. And so realizing that there are things that you just need to let go of. Um, and I think that that's, that's also been a big learning. I'm literally like a little bit taken back. Cause I'm like, I needed to hear that today. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But I think perfectionism is such an interesting topic because it really is just something that we, I think, use to try to keep ourselves from getting hurt. We yeah. think that if we just focus on getting everything right, we assume there is a way to get everything right, then we're never going to get disappointed and we're never going to get hurt and all of those things. And, and I, I think once you get to this point where you realize that hurt and disappointment and failure, like that is part of the human experience and learning how to pick your ass up after those things happen, that's resilience. And that is so, so valuable and so important. And that's where things get interesting. And so I think that that's really what I've been trying to work on with, with my own perfectionism is yeah. realizing like, I don't know if you've ever met anyone for whom all the things in their life is, have, have gone right, they're incredibly boring. They're incredibly oh, yeah. entitled. Like there's just nothing there, right? And what stories do they have as exactly. well? Exactly. Like I want the nitty gritty. I want people, like I don't love the fact that people have struggled, but I want to hear from those people who have been at rock bottom. They've turned things around. Like they have a story. Like, cause that's when like the passion, like the kind of the emotion comes out. And that's what to me makes someone like human. Like, I don't know what per perfection is. Like I'm, I'm, I'm the fact that for some bizarre reason that we're all kind of chasing it. Like yeah. who's anyone to say like that's what perfection is? It's, it's no. it baffles me. Yeah, and you're right. I mean, anything that has supposedly been perfect to me has been incredibly boring, right? Because the stories are how you fell on your face and how you picked yourself back up Yeah, because that's inspiring, right? That is the human spirit in action. And so that's where the good stuff is not the, like, I don't know, everything just kind of went my way and it's all been good. The end. All right. <laughs> oh, a great story. That was <laughs> okay. What's on Netflix. That one. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Put that one back on the shelf. <laughs> right. Right. I, can't have you on the show without talking a little bit about the movie career like <laughs> yeah you were in in my eyes two of the most iconic films mm -hmm. ever mrs doubtfire and independence day like yeah huge 
But Independence Day, as fun as it was, I'm not a huge fan of Aliens, so I'm going to park that one for now. <laughs> Apologies, yeah. you were great in it. <laughs> yeah. but, but did you know, like, when you were recording Mrs. Doubtfire, that it was going to be this kind of, like, something that people are still quoting and, like, dressing up as and, like, still has such a special place in, like, people's hearts? Like, did you know when filming that it was going to have that impact? Absolutely not. <laughs> absolutely not I remember reading the script and I knew that that Robin was was attached that he was going to be playing the lead and so that was exciting I was a fan of Mork and yeah. Mindy I was 14 when we filmed Outfire um so I, I knew who he was and so I was like well that's good but I don't get this script like I don't know how it is ever going to be possible that he is going to be able to look and act so different that it's going to be believable and i'm i i literally at 14 worried i was tanking my career by taking this <laughs> wow that i thought was going to be awful i thought we were just doing a rip off of tootsie i was really concerned that it was just not going to be any good and uh so I don't want to be wrong. that person, but you were wrong. I was wrong. <laughs> I was totally wrong about that, which was pointed out to me in spectacular fashion because Robin, uh, we had been doing rehearsals for a few weeks. And so we hadn't started filming yet. And the uh, my brother and sister and I, uh, Matt and Mara, they they called us to set chris columbus was was there and his mother was coming to visit for just the day to kind of meet everybody and yeah. stuff like that and she was staying for lunch and so matt and mara and i went and we had lunch with with chris columbus's mom and we were all trying to be really well behaved right because it's our boss's mom and we're <laughs> making small talk and all that sort of stuff and uh we finished lunch and we went back to the trailer uh and then Robin and Chris were so thrilled to inform us that we had actually had lunch with Mrs. Doubtfire. We didn't realize it. No. Yeah. Yeah. So it was that pointed out to me that I was entirely wrong uh, because we had lunch with Robin in costume and completely bought that that was Chris's mom. <laughs> I don't even know what to say to that. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Yeah. So I went home that day and went, oh my God, actually this move might be pretty good. Well, this might work. But it, it paid off. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. But wow. oh my God, we felt so stupid. We could not, we were so embarrassed. Um, I was most embarrassed because I was the oldest and a perfectionist. Yeah. And so I felt like I should have figured it out. I don't think Matt really <laughs> cared. And Mara was five. So whatever. Um, <laughs> But I was just, I, I couldn't believe that I had been, I had been so, so spectacularly clever, duped. <laughs> but there's like, there's, there's, there's something there because I, I always, I feel like I'm that person who watches these type of films, like, how would they not know? You know, like when you see like those prank shows and stuff like that, like, you yeah. would know that, you would know that. So you've just proven me wrong as well, because quite clearly for someone who's very clued up, <laughs> you were fooled. I was completely fooled. Yes. Wow. So to answer your question, no, had no idea that, um, you know, almost 30 years later, people would still be quoting it to me and asking me if I like Dick Van Dyke and um, recognizing me. Do you ever get sick of it? <laughs> you know, I went through a phase, especially when I, when I first left the film industry and retired from being an actor. Yeah and really wanted to put that all behind me. I, I was an actor for 18 years and, and for a time I really enjoyed it. And then I got to a point where I really did not. Yeah. And I really wanted to do something else with my life and, uh, and find something that, that just felt like a more authentic contribution to, to the world and, and what I wanted to be doing. I had no clue at that point, but I knew that, you know, I was kind of done with the Hollywood scene. Yeah. It, it's, uh, there are a lot of really difficult, painful, awful trappings in that, in that world. And I was done with them. And so I think when I, when I first left LA, 
Um, I, I was in my early twenties and I was really sick of talking about it. I was, uh, <laughs> I, I wanted to be done. I, I was like really tired of being the doubtfire girl and just sort of realizing like, oh my God, something I did for a few months when I was 14 is going to be like engraved on my tombstone. Um, <laughs> you know, it, there, there the are doubtfire moments. Doubtfire girl. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Uh, you know, there were moments where I, I felt haunted by it, but I think, you know, I've, I've gotten to a better place with it now where I realize like everybody has a past, everybody yeah. has things in their past that maybe don't reflect exactly who they are now. Right. And so I, I now, I think I have an appreciation for it and I have an appreciation for the the nostalgia that people have for it and that it was a movie that that meant something to people a movie that showed families in a different light than had really been shown before had shown that you don't need the stereotypical happy ending in order to be okay and this is really I'm interested and I'm yeah. so glad you brought this up because it's one of those films that kind of like growing up it was like my mom and dad were the only ones who were kind of like I mean they were married but then they got divorced but my my parents were the only parents who did that so it was uh -huh. like films like missing I mean my dad never dressed as like a Scottish woman and like <laughs> tried to babysit <laughs> but it was he's still got time maybe maybe another time maybe, maybe. so it's still yeah less said about that the better but you never know <laughs> yes <laughs> But it was from like a, that kind of movie that made me realize that, well, yeah, not every family is like, you know, two kids, two parents, like running around, like happy ended. Like that's just not life. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I think that was really important that there was talk. The studio actually wanted them to get back together in the end. And they wanted the stereotypical happy ending. Uh... And the director, Chris Columbus and Robin were like, no, we'll walk. We're not doing it that way. Um, it needs it needs to be something that can can help people and inspire people to to know that like it doesn't have to look any certain way. Um, and so I think I have much more of an, an appreciation now for people's love for the movie, and it doesn't it doesn't yeah. quite feel as as haunting now. I kind of <laughs> take it as as a part of my past that I that I appreciate and and a part of my past that you know has has gotten to me gotten me where where I am now and and yeah. and I love where I am now no I, I honestly like and to be fair we wouldn't be sat here having this conversation well we might we just you might have been in very different circumstances you just don't know yeah exactly you mentioned, and you could please feel free here to tell me to shut up or like, you know, I imagine some of this is quite private, but with like, you speak so highly of the legend that is obviously Robin like, yeah. Williams. Like he has brought so much joy to every generation so far and will continue to do so. Like I've, I've when I was doing like my research and stuff like that and going through like, I imagine he has had such like an, a positive impact Mm. like on your life and mm -hmm. even with that mental health conversation like I've read somewhere like how open he was to you was that kind of would you say that gave you like a little bit of a confidence boost to be like yeah okay I can talk about this he absolutely inspired what I do today because he was wow. very open with me and, you know, nobody else had really talked to me in that way about mental health, that no one had talked to me in that way about addiction. And, and so him being courageous enough, quite honestly, to, to be that open with me and to talk to me about those things, that's, that's where it kind of planted the seed in me of, if you are honest about what you go through, you can change other people's lives. You can help them. So it really is what I do today is a bit of like, you know, passing it along and, and trying to offer to other people what he offered to me because it was um, hugely impactful for me at, at 14 to know that he, he was on my side, that he understood. That is that, that gave me goosebumps. Aww, yeah. <laughs> it's honestly, it's so beautiful. Yeah. And 
I can just see like how special that is. Like even just like on your face, like talking about it. Would you like now, especially with all the work you do, like on like, you know, wellness, meditation, mental health, like if you could kind of go back and tell like your like 14 year old self or even like younger, mm. like what, what would you say? Oh, I think I'd just say you're not alone. You're not alone. There are so many other people that are dealing with this and you're going to be okay. I love that. Yeah. Uh, (laughs) I thought you said I wasn't going to cry. Oh my God, don't do that. Don't don't, don't do that. Because I feel like I'm not getting emotional. (laughs) (laughs) Well, let's just spend the rest of the podcast crying. I'm sure your audience will love that. (laughs) Oh, they do it. They they usually cry when they listen to this. (laughs) Crying is good. I love, I, I, it's oh, I love it. thing to say I love crying, but I do love crying. It's very, I mean, it's therapeutic. And I, I think it took me a long time to learn to be able to like sit with someone who is crying and not say, don't cry. Like, <laughs> I pat them on the back. Like they're there. <laughs> you're just like, yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. You can cry. It's all right. Yeah. Oh, I love that. <laughs> but yeah. it is, it's an outlet of the emotion though, isn't it? Because it's mm-hmm. stuff like, and especially to the to the men listening to this and well to fair whoever's listening to this letting it out is genuinely one of the best things you can do like bottling it up believe me like whether you deal with it now or in like three four years time regardless of the time you are going to deal with it so it's better to get it off your chest now whatever the bothering you whether it's you know how big or how minor you think that kind of issue is mm-hmm. talking about it letting it out whether it's a cry whether it's going to the gym, whether it's like writing it down, you need to do it. I learned this and I felt that this was just so helpful for me in thinking about it is that emotions are cyclical. So they have a cycle, they have a beginning, a middle and an end. And so what happens is that for a lot of us, we feel those emotions rising up and we just try to shove them down. Mm. And in fact, when we can let them kind of complete that cycle, go through that, we'll get to the end. It's like a wave, right? It's never going to last. It's not going to last forever. But for so many of us, we've learned to shove everything down. So we get stuck in like the beginning and middle part of the emotion. And we just keep reliving that part because we won't actually fully feel it in order for it to like crest and and for it to end. And so I, I find that that's just such a helpful way to think about it. Because for me, if it's you know, sadness or, or disappointment, it feels like, oh my God, if I fully feel this, it's going to last just forever. And that's not actually how emotions work. And so being able to sit with that emotion without shoving it down or, you know, pretending it's not there or getting angry at yourself because you're feeling emotions. If you can actually sit with it and breathe through it, you can get to the end of it. I honestly think that's some of the best advice I have ever been given. And uh, it, it, it's I so true. <laughs> yeah, it's so true. And it's just, it, it's a matter of, and this is why I love a mindfulness practice, a meditation practice, is because it teaches you to sit with what is uncomfortable. And it teaches you to know that you are strong enough to handle the discomfort um, and that you can breathe through it. And there are all of these techniques for how, you know, what to do with that discomfort when you feel it, but you let that, you know, you let that wave come and you let that wave go. And when you can do that, it's, it's no longer, you're no longer stuck in that repeat and you're no longer bottling things up. One of my final questions was going to be like, have you got any advice to anyone who maybe listens to this and feeling anxious or, you know, feeling a little bit like they need to have a little bit of help? But I feel like you've just smashed that out of the park. (laughs) Did I I ruin the final question? Ruined my finale. (laughs) Oh, sorry. (laughs) No, but honestly, like if someone is listening in and, you know, they've kind of picked up on some of the stuff that we're thinking about, especially around like, 
anxiety and stuff because the world is opening up again now and yeah. you know I feel like there is a lot of anxiety about people even just going back to work you know going to do like the shop you know there's especially in the UK like as of I think it's next week like we don't have to wear masks anymore so there's a lot of kind of like mm, you know what is going to kind of have like but if someone is feeling that anxiety and those anxious thoughts like what advice would you give them yeah uncertainty is so difficult to sit with yeah and i think you know we've we've learned a lot about that and i think we're going to continue to learn a lot about that you know in the coming months and years um so i i have so many resources that i love being able to share so um if you go to my website which is reallisajacob.com um, I have guided meditations. Um, I highly recommend starting a, a mindfulness meditation program. So I have guided meditations. I have beginner yoga classes. Um, I have a lot of writing that I do on this. My second book, which is called Not Just Me, has basically everything I know about anxiety, depression, panic. I do a lot of interviews with people who have all kinds of mental wellness issues from you know, grade schoolers who are dealing with sensory integration issues to combat veterans who have post-traumatic stress to folks who have eating disorders and who um, are cutters. And basically I just kind of gather all the best information about, about anxiety, depression, and panic, and, and it's in that book. Um, so I do write a lot about those things. I have a YouTube channel where I have ton, tons of videos of, you know, anti-anxiety tips. Like if you're having a panic attack, I will literally walk you through moment by moment how to wow. come down from a panic attack, um, all those sorts of things. So I, I have a ton of resources. So I think, you know, if I'm trying to sum it up in a nice little bow for the end of our podcast, I would just say that even if it feels like you have tried everything and you are still struggling, there are options for you. There are possibilities. There are other things that you can try and things can get better. You are hands down, probably one of my favorite guests I've had on here. It has literally had everything that I could possibly want from a podcast guest. Honestly. <laughs> Thank you. See, I'm not crying again. <laughs> Thank you. That no, seriously, sorry, that means I lied the world. and said like I wasn't going to go like full Oprah, but sorry, <laughs> it's all different. No, it's all that lie. means the world to me. I, I, I'm just, I'm, I'm so, I'm honored to be on your show. I'm thrilled that you are talking about these really important issues because I think this is, this is how we change things. Definitely, and in all honesty, I'm glad you left Hollywood. Because I feel like <laughs> this too. is your calling in life. Oh, me too. Thank you. And the impact. I mean, even just from this conversation, from me sat here having it, like I, I, like I said, like some of the best advice that I've been given. And it's like, you've kind of took some of the thoughts that are in my head and said them out loud back to me. And even that is so powerful, even when you're, like, you're looking after your own mental health. And I know there's people that listen to this show that are going to take so much value from like your words mm -hmm. and even just like hearing your story like thank you just oh, genuinely Taylor, thank for you joining so me much. for a waffle it's been brilliant brilliant thank you